Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, and this is your Cannabis Business Podcast. So should we start with this Leafly article with the cannabis sublingual strips and whether or not they work? Sure. So you've had some experience with these, have you not? Or am I? Yeah. Because I've had them before. I can't remember where, but it was about a year or two ago, maybe 2017. Uh, it tastes just kind of like a regular mouth strip, dissolves in your mouth, works fairly quickly because it crosses that blood-brain barrier expediently. But I figure the, at least with my reaction or, or my experience has been small micro doses, maybe it was 10 milligrams. It certainly wasn't a hundred. Um, and so I didn't really feel a whole lot of effects, but you know, it's more normalization. There's a lot of different things that people are trying with regards to product size. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right size for, for things, right? It's like, again, Russian stuff to market without even testing all of that. Yeah. So the uh, Leafly article goes on to say that some of the main components of this being popular, I guess, is because it's fast acting and effective. But as well as discrete, obviously with joints being discrete, that's a big popular item. You have an asthmatic inhaler that's very useful because you can have it in a, a hospital or an airplane, uh, anywhere that vaping isn't allowed. So that discreteness, that usability, you can pop these Listerine stri- or these uh, cannabis strips anywhere uh, and, and use them anytime. Right, right. Well, and again, um, there is something about being on a cruise ship, right, or about to jump on an airplane or whatever and wanting to have your medicine that some of these different technologies really allow for, you know, sublingual strips, um, uh, again, the inhaler, a lot of different uh, technologies, if you will, to do it, make it where you can have your medicine when you want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody who has to do some speaking event or they have anxiety, there's some anxiety attack. They're able to take that and not have it be, um, or not have it look weird, but it be socially acceptable. I dig that. I might actually use the inhaler during my next speaking event. What about the benefits of sublingual absorption? You've done some R&D on uh, asthmatic inhaler. Um, do we know if, they're, if the body absorbs it better or if there's more yeah. of an uptake? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, here's the deal. Basically, less is more, right? You can actually use less, um, you know, again, because you're, you know, typically you're looking, this is an application of medicine. Right. This isn't, oh, I want to get super high. Where's my inhaler? You know, I got other things for that. Uh, and in turn, uh, proper dosage size, that kind of thing. It's pretty neat. You know, and this is where, again, things that are fixed in volume. Oh, here's a, a Listerine strip that's, you know, five milligrams or 10 milligrams or 100 milligrams, but fixed. Right. Where you know what it is and what you're taking. That's pretty neat. Definitely. And, you know, you, you touched on a good point about proper dosing. Uh, it's definitely one of been the, the top investment drivers to try to find technology and data uh, that incorporates uh, a, a dose, proper dosage that is expected, something that is consistent every time. And so if they're able to, to manufacture, develop a product that is able to have consistent dosing, that's discreet, uh, that's cheap and effective and fast acting, I think that's going to be a game changer. Right, right. That, that again, that's medicine, right? That, that's, you know, that's the way medicine's supposed to be. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's definitely some room in the market, right? So according to Yahoo Finance, the U.S. cannabis sales should be more than double or should, more, uh, should double to $22 billion within the next three years. I know we kind of hear a lot about that. Um, but that's considerably more than the 3.4 billion that we saw in 2014, according to BDS Analytics. Well, you know those trend lines, right? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, global licensed store sales in 2018 surpassed 10 billion for the first time in history. Uh, so they're expecting that to double to more than 22 billion in three years. But I think it's going to be more than that because there's a lot of states that haven't even gone on board yet. Uh, California hasn't seen the full expectation. Um, I think with uh, Illinois just getting on board, you're seeing Florida kind of being the fastest developing state, and that's still medical. Uh, So with each new state, you're going to see a compound amount of uh, sales. And so doubling that totally depends on how many more states get on board. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you could imagine a world where you drive up to the local Quickie Mart, run in, and go get your pack of breath, uh, breath strips or your uh, pack of mints mm-hmm. and, you know, run away. And that's your cannabis consumption. You could see that. And you could see what the, what that kind of access would do to those kind of numbers. 
Right, and so the numbers are coming from Canaccord Genuity and analysts uh, that said the the market would hit 22 billion by 2022. They're also saying that the compounded annual growth rate is going to be almost 20 percent over the next three years, um, which again is um, is completely dependent upon how well Illinois does, how fast California uh, allows all products to be sold, um, and California alone could skew those numbers. It could be tripled. Um, and California could hold a third of that just on their own. I think California. Yeah, huge market, uh, f maybe fifth largest GDP in the world. So a lot of opportunities for there for sure. And, and in fact, um, we'll get to that in a second about California definitely eating into uh, Canada's expectations. <laughs> Um, we're seeing a lot of deals right now. A lot of U.S. capital is um, a lot of a lot of U.S. companies are going up to Canada. They're filing IPOs and they're bringing that capital back into the U.S. and they're doing it better than Canadian companies. We saw that Canopy Growth CEO was kicked out. The board of directors uh, fired him essentially after some not so luster uh, sales. Uh, but in the U.S., we're seeing a lot more companies going up, getting capital in Canada, bringing that back and expanding either via hemp or medical marijuana or in-state producer processor retailer cannabis stores. And so uh, our buddy, Scott Griper, uh, we met him back at the Marijuana Show Season 2 um, in Denver. So he's president of Viridian Capital Advisors and uh, gives us some really good detail this past week. I was seeing um, five of the nine track mergers and acquisition deals targeting U.S. based companies. And so uh, there's some key takeaways that Scott Griper goes into. Um, so some of the top raises that they point out last week from True Leave, which is a market leader in dispensary operations in Florida, closed a $70 million debt capital raise, which to me is fascinating because debt capital is not easy as equity. That means that there's a lot of people that are interested in it more than taking a, an equity percentage or ownership uh, that has voting rights. They're taking a, a step back and just allowing that debt ownership um, right. to, to ride. So. Very oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, in terms of unique, you know, it'll be interesting to see if that's a trend or an outlier. Now, those bond, if it is a bond, those bondholders have first rights on property, plant, and equipment. Um, but it's it's definitely a, a unique position this early right. in the market. So uh, the other top raise that closed this week is Metafarm Labs, a Canadian uh, infused product manufacturer that raised seventy five million Canadian dollars. Uh, for net proceeds being to fund ongoing capital expenditures in Canada and Australia for domestic and international expansion, research and development. So that's interesting. And then top M&A deals, MJ Freeway, our good friends there. Um, they raised some mon money. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, they merged actually with a publicly traded company called Akerna ticker symbol K-E-R-N, and then another company, um, Sertura Wellness. They have a dominant presence in the medical marijuana dispensary in Florida, and we can see that they have uh, an international expansion around after raising $100 million. So they've raised a total of $300 million, um, and is now trying to become the leading global cannabis health and wellness company based out of Florida. And again these numbers right and you know, it's interesting having been on both sides of the coin where we're you know down in the street in the store buying a five dollar joint and then over watching somebody work on a you know a a seven or an eight figure deal again a zany market that's certainly going through some some fluctuation there Karan. It is, and, and can, there's an article in Bloomberg that said Canada blew its chance to be the world's pot leader. Um, it basically kind of just talks about how U.S. cannabis firms have taken a step to lead uh, despite being federally illegal, and I think that has a lot to do with it. The, a lot of these valuations have been suppressed because of that illegality, whereas up in Canada, they're able to be speculated beyond belief. Um, yeah, and at the same time, you've seen it, you know, Canada... You know, there was all the, the publicity and the, the market rollout, the actual ability to be in the street and go buy what I want as a cannabis consumer. Man, what a, you know, it's a cluster. 
Yes, we also saw that with oil, that it was really low production. It was almost, it wasn't black, but it wasn't amber. It wasn't something that you would want to dab. And the flour had mold in some of it. Other stuff, the terpene profiles were not there. It was like hay or just non-existent. Right, right. Early in the market, people learning. And again, that's okay. But at the same time, my gosh, they let, they've let a lot of time go by from, you know, just from the perspective of if you're in a sprint, right? Definitely. And a lot of people thought that Canada would be leading that way. And they've, they've rolled out beverages and concentrate sales and topicals slowly. It'll be this October. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to figure out from the previous oil and pre-roll sales and the, all the mistakes they made. They've hopefully figured that out and they can kind of take back some of the, the loss in market share, potential market share. I know that $4 billion from Constellation Brands um, going into the Canadian market for beverages, they're definitely hoping that that pays off. Well, you know, again, when you say to yourself, you know, I mean, how, how did air quote Canada fumble it, right? I mean, it, it's not really air quote Canada, it's air quote bureaucracy, right? And again, the whole thing of whoever's gonna get their bureaucratic mess cleaned up first so that the market can do what the market needs to do is gonna win the global Canada's market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so Harborside, you know, Steve D'Angelo out of California, he just got a quarter of a billion dollars, 226 million US uh, from going public up in Canada. And so he's, he's, he's not going to be the, the last company. There, I think there a lot of people are still going to use Canada as a gateway to come back into the US and, and sure. take advantage of, of that, those opportunities well, there. Get, get banked up and come back to work. Absolutely. Time will tell. Uh, October 17th is, is the day. So stay tuned. <laughs> Looking forward to it. time. And with that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is a Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out.